Bible, but only getting babble. Are you tired of this commercial? <laughs> so am I. Well, these commercials may be old and boring, but the gospel we preach never is. So come study the Bible with the Church of Christ. We're meeting at 250 the Boulevard. Our new times are Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study and 10 a.m. for worship, and then Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Come visit with us. We hope to see you there. Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting babble? Are you tired of this commercial? <laughs> so am I. Well, these commercials may be old and boring, but the gospel we preach never is. So come study the Bible with the Church of Christ. We're meeting at 250 the Boulevard. Our new times are Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study and 10 a.m. for worship, and then Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Come visit with us. We hope to see you there. Hi everyone, welcome to Two Rivers Plaza located at 307 West Meadow Road right here in Eden, North Carolina between Ray's Bait and Tackle and Ashley's Antiques. We're going to take a look inside of some of these wonderful shops and let you see what's here. So come with me, let's take a look. We're with uh, Courtney Henniger now Hi. at Shirley Divine Hair Hi. Studio. Mm -hmm. Courtney, what made you decide to come to Two Rivers Plaza for your business? Um, well, I was looking for a change. I've been doing hair another place for going on seven years there and I just I just needed a change and when I decided to do it I just said let's go do it and a couple others came with me so it was just we all needed to change. It but was, this is your place? This is this is mine. Um, I have experience running a salon before mm -hmm. but never actually owning one so it's a little bit different but it's it's awesome. Well what made you choose Two Rivers Plaza? Um, a little birdie told me that there was a place here that had, <laughs> that had used to um, have yeah. a, a salon in it. Mm -hmm. And I think she kind of did that on purpose because she kind of knew I was ready for a change. Um, a good friend of mine uh, who was also Ira's. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Folks, I have survived a lot of events. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, A Word from the Lord. Um, James Ophir here with you, and as always, we're glad that you are with us and you are, have chosen to uh, study the Bible with us. We'll get what does the Bible say off there in a minute, and, and uh, we'll also be taking phone calls later on in the program. But we want to give you our content information in case you are in our area and you want to visit with us. 250 the Boulevard is where we're meeting. And uh, you can reach me at 276-340-2653 or 336-394-5721. Word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me uh, via email. And we hope that you will, will do that very thing. We, we're having good Bible studies uh, on Thursday night uh, at 7 o'clock. We're going through the book of Romans. Actually, Brother Johnny Robertson is, is teaching that on Thursday nights. I'm teaching uh, the book of Galatians in Martinsville on Wednesday night. And so if you uh, want to study either one of those books, we'd be glad for you to come and visit with us on those, uh, on those occasions, Wednesday night at 823 Starling Avenue in Martinsville and, uh, and then the 120 American Legion in Danville on Tuesday nights. And as always, of course, on Sundays, you can uh, uh, assemble with us and uh, we'd be glad to uh, answer any questions you have or you want to examine what the Church of Christ is all about. We'll be glad for you to do that very thing. So we hope that you will take advantage of that. Come out and visit with us. We we'll remind you also of the uh, What Does the Bible Say program uh, coming out of Rocky Mount, North Carolina on WHIGTV.com on Tuesday nights at 9 o'clock. Brother Johnny Robertson is down there. And uh, <clears throat> that's something you can watch online. So you can watch uh, if, you're, if you're not in that area, uh, you can uh, watch it online and, uh, and let us know that you're, that you're watching. We'll be glad to do that. Friends, tonight I want to begin by letting you hear a, uh, a call from uh, several years ago and listen to what the, the, the caller is saying because we're talking about right and wrong and, and talking about uh, if someone is bad or not. So my question is, what do we call it? If we're not going to say certain things, then what are we supposed to say? Now, you'll know what that means. After you hear this, after you hear this video clip, it's it's a couple minutes long, I believe. But I just want you to uh, 
uh, to listen and let's just listen to how people think. Because what we're trying to do uh, on this program is get people to think really about, number one, what they're saying, and number two, about what they've been taught or, or what they believe, and then compare that with the truth. And I, I think, friends, what you'll find is sometimes people believe certain things or they, or they say certain things or taught certain things because they really haven't given any kind of critical thinking to what they've been taught or, or what they uh, uh, have been uh, uh, educated with, so to speak, what they've been led to believe, and they just take things in and say, well, this is the way it must be, not even considering whether it is contrary to truth or not. Now listen to what this man says, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Are you playing? Had been. That's me. You know, uh, they wouldn't be bad. Uh, they... Stop convincing people that they're bad and they won't be bad. Yes, sir. Now, explain what you mean by that. Let me let me start this over again because he says he makes something very he makes a statement at the very beginning that's very important to the conversation. He gives us his name. You're on Wormlow. Hello? Hi, this is uh, Mike. Hey, Mike. Uh, yeah, if you would stop convincing people that they are bad, then, you know, uh, they wouldn't be bad. Uh, they... Stop convincing people that they're bad and they won't be bad. Yes, sir. Now, explain what you mean by that. Have, so, well, have, I, have I said anybody's bad? Yeah, huh? we're not bad people. I did, did I say you were? They're preaching how, how, how bad that, that, that people are. Have I used the word bad? We're just normal. Have I used the word bad tonight? Have I used the word bad tonight? Hello? Yeah. Have I used the word bad tonight? Did I stutter? Well, well how do you, why do you think that I'm saying you're bad? If you haven't obeyed God, yes, you're bad, but that's not me talking, that's the Bible. Now, why do you have a problem if God God says that a sinner is it. vile? Now, I mean, you know, I, why do you have a problem with that? I, I, you know, I believe in God every day. I pray to God every day. You know, it's like just because, you know, that, you know, I don't believe, you know, in, in, in you know, exactly what you believe in. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm damned. I'm, I'm here, you know, I'm. I'm damned. So, so you're saying I shouldn't tell people they're bad. Now, if I if I was in this particular instance telling people they're bad, I have a bad it, habit. Is that is that is that does that make me bad if I'm telling you you're bad? Does that make me bad if I'm telling you you're bad? No, you. No, you're turning it back on me now. You're exactly right. I'm turning it back on you. You're saying that I shouldn't tell people they're bad, which I haven't said people are bad. They're sinners, which that I guess that makes them bad. But you, you ask me why I keep telling people they're bad, and yet that seems to be something that you would consider to be bad. Now, am I being bad? Are you telling me that I'm bad when I tell people they're bad? Hello? Yes, sir. So I am. You're, you're saying you're affirming. You're saying that I am bad when I tell people they're bad. True? False? What? Yes? No? I can't hear you. I can't see you shake your head. Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. I know, but are you answering my question? Am I bad when I, I'm if I were to tell people they're bad? If you're not going to answer, I'll let you go. Am I bad when I tell people that they're bad? Okay, thanks for your call. Okay, now, friends, uh, here, here's the problem that the gentleman was having. He was having a problem with a saying or a teaching that someone is bad. And his argument at the very beginning was, if we would stop telling people they were bad, they wouldn't be bad. Now, think about that for a minute. 
Friends, if we stop saying something is sin, then it may cease to be sin in the mind of man, but does that mean that it stops being sin in the mind of God? Just because someone says, well, it's, it's not lo- no longer a sin, does that mean that it is not a sin? If something is legalized by man, does that mean that it's okay then for man to do it? Does God sanction it then because after all man has said it's okay? See, we're, we're getting to this in society where people don't want to be told that they're bad or that they're wrong or that the behavior is wrong or that their behavior is, is uh, degenerate or that their ha- behavior is not right, that it's not something that is, that is acceptable. Everybody wants to be accepted. Everybody wants to be told that what they're doing is okay and no one wants to hear, no, you're wrong. You need to change. Now, while he was saying that, you know, and he wouldn't say that I was bad for saying that a person was bad, but did you notice that he said his name was Mike and then later on he said his name was Dan? Now, was he lying to me? And if he was lying to me, was, was that bad? See, the Bible talks about liars are going to have their place in the lake that burns a fire and brimstone. So liars definitely are bad, according to the Bible, but am I supposed to tell someone that they shouldn't lie? Am I supposed to tell someone that if you do this, you're bad or you need to change, you need to make some, some uh, changes in your life? And so what we're getting at, friends, is we're, we're seeing that people don't want us to call bad things bad. Well, what are we supposed to call them? What are we supposed to call them? Let me just go ahead and put a scripture up here while we're, while we're on this point. Listen to what the Bible says in Isaiah Isaiah 5 and verse 20. Isaiah says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put, uh, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now, when people start uh, changing uh, what is right and wrong, when they start uh, wanting to hear that, that things that are, that are generally considered bad are not bad, then we're going to have a problem. But what do we call it then? So what do we call it if it's not bad? Listen to this caller. Now, what what are we supposed to say then? If we not if we can't say something is bad, if we if we can't say something is bad, then what are we supposed to do? Listen to this uh, gentleman as he calls in, and listen to some of his comments along these same lines. And I hope this won't play. I didn't say I kept the and, I, and I'm saying, sir, the Ten Commandments. You, you can't get on and judge people by what they do. Sir, I can judge people by what they do. Jesus tells me to judge people by what they do. Judge. Jesus tells me to do that. Well, I said, heard you say, Jesus has told you to do that. Jesus spoke to you. Through his word. Through his word. That's right. Here's what Jesus says right here. John 7, 24. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Now, did he tell me to judge? You're not, that, that, you're not supposed to judge people. Jesus says judge righteous judgment. Am I supposed to judge or not? Who's going to have the last judgment? Jesus says for me to judge righteous judgment. Am I supposed to judge or not? How do you know what righteous judgment is? Jesus says judge righteous judgment. Am I supposed to judge or not? I'm just asking you, how do you know what righteous judgment is? I'll tell you if you tell me if I'm supposed to judge or not. If you can tell me how, what righteous judgment is. Okay. Righteous judgment is judgment based upon the righteous word. Look at this right here. The word of righteousness. That's this book right here. So if I open the word of righteousness, then then when I I, uh, uh, want want to make sure if something is righteous or not, I can judge righteous judgment right here. All right. If it's not according to the righteous word of God, 
then I'm going to say it's not righteous. I made a righteous judgment. All right, now, friends, so we can call things, we can judge things as being bad or good. We can make a determination based upon righteous judgment, which is going to come from the righteous Word of God. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Romans 1, verse 17. Paul says, let's start in verse 16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And then he says, For therein, wherein? The gospel. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For it's in the gospel that the righteousness of God is revealed. The, the gospel, the word of God, tells man how he can be righteous. And therefore, what God calls righteous and what God would say is unrighteous. So if we use God's word, then we're going to be able to make a righteous judgment, a, a, righteous, uh, uh, yeah, a righteous judgment upon what uh, is good. Or what is bad? But if we can't make that distinction, then what are we going to call it? What are we going to say? So if we can't say bad things are bad, if we can't say wicked people are wicked, if we can't talk about things in a, in a uh, giving a standard of right and wrong, what are we supposed to say? Are we supposed to say everything's okay? Are we supposed to say everything is good? Are we supposed to say everything is righteous then? Are we supposed to say that everything should be accepted if we can't say bad things are bad, if we cannot make the distinction, then what do we do? See, friends, there has to be this standard. There has to be this baseline by which we all determine something is good or bad. Now, if I don't use the word bad, I wonder this. Could I use the word better or best? How can you even use the word good if there is no bad? If you can't say something is bad, how then can you say it's good? What are you comparing it to? What are you comparing it to? You know, these consumer reports come out and they'll tell you what the best car is. They'll tell you what the, uh, the best toaster is. They'll tell you what the best uh, 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 microwave is. They'll tell you what the best TV is, the best computer is. But how do they do that? Unless they compare to things that are better or worse. Now, friends, why is it that people don't want their actions to be scrutinized? How, why is it they don't want their, their lifestyle to be scrutinized? See, that's why, that's why when you start talking about things like homosexuality, everybody says, oh, you're just a bigot and you're judgmental. No, it's not that, friends. It's really about you not wanting to admit or to face the fact that what you're doing or a lifestyle that you're living is actually something that is not approved. You want to be accepted and you want to force what you do upon other people and want them to accept it when they want to use a standard like God's authority. Now, can we call things good and bad? If we can't, friends, what are we going to do with this? And this has been in the news lately. This just happened just the other day. But what are we going to say about this? You know, just the other day in, in England, in, in the United Kingdom, there were two men, two Muslims, who waited for a soldier to come out of the barracks where he was living, and they brutally attacked him, hacked him into pieces, almost cutting his head off, and laid out there in the street and then went and talked to people and, uh, and were saying, this is, this is what, what's coming. Now, are we going to say, are we going to say that this was good? Are we going to say this is bad? Are we not going to say anything? You know what? There's a lot of people that don't want to say anything because then they get scrutinized. Then they start being looked at. Well, friends, if we're all using the Bible as the, as the, as the, the, uh, the baseline, the foundation for what's right and wrong, then we won't have any worry about being scrutinized. But friends, how are we going to call this heinous act, how are we going to call it wicked? How are we going to call it corrupt? How are we going to call it uh, uh, evil? If, 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 we, if we can't call bad things bad. 
if we can't call good things good? How do you do that? See, friends, I know that there are people who would say, this is terrible, this is, this is horrendous, I am just uh, uh, aghast, it is, is ghastly, it is appalling, it's wicked. But friends, if you can make that judgment, then why is it that we can't make similar judgments based upon things that God says are just as wicked in his eyes? Now, someone says, well... I've never killed anybody, never hacked them in pieces. Okay, you may not. But Jesus said, if you hate your brother, John said, if you hate your brother, you've, you've committed murder in your heart. Now, you're not, you may not be guilty of the actual act, but you're just as guilty if it, it's in your heart, if that hatred in your heart, you're just as guilty of it. See that? So what we're talking about is, we're talking about what God considers sin and what God com considers heinous we have to then look and say, this is what's bad. This is what's, what's evil. This is what's wicked. If we don't use a standard, how are we going to condemn this? Notice, in Genesis chapter 6, in verse 11, the Bible says, the earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth. And behold, it was corrupt. And all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. How did that happen? How did it happen? James tells us that the way, the way that corruption begins is when man is when man deviates from serving God and actually follows his own choice. Notice this. Let no man say, this is James 1.13, let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted with God, for God cannot be tempted not with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, it bringeth forth death. Now, this is how the earth becomes corrupt. When people don't have any reserves or any restraint on what they're going to do, and they don't want anybody else to restrain them. Guess what happens? The world becomes corrupt, and the world then turns around and says, hey, don't you tell me that I can't do something. Don't tell me that I'm wrong. Don't tell me that, that what I'm doing is sinful. Now, friends, here's what I want you to consider. Are you of the mindset that you cannot tell some, someone that something is wrong? Are you of the mindset that says if you tell people they're wrong, then you are going to drive them away? You know, there's some members of the church that have this same idea. I'm talking about members of the Lord's church. I'm not talking about denominations. I'm talking about members of the Lord's church. I'm talking about Christians who have this mindset that if you tell people they're wrong, then you're going to drive them away. Well, friends, they're already lost. Where are they going to go? Hell number two. See, they're already lost. Therefore, what we have to do is be very specific and plain and make sure they understand that what they're doing is wrong. Do you realize that because society, because society has determined that they're not going to call anybody wicked and more and more we're, we're, we're getting to the point that we're not going to call anything bad and more and more we're getting to the point that we don't want to say anything is wrong lest we be uh, uh, criticized for being mean ourselves that we just don't say anything do you realize we're getting to the point that pretty soon we're not going to be able to say here is the standard of right and wrong because no one wants to, wants to, wants to cry out against what is wrong because no one wants to draw a very clear distinct line between what is right and wrong or good and evil do you realize that's where we're coming and do you realize, friends, that whether you admit it or not, that religion, that religion is on the decline because of there, there being no distinction between what is good and what is bad. In other words, there's no definitiveness, and so, therefore, nothing is to be desired. I want you to consider this article. I want you to consider this article 
in uh, from uh, Time Magazine. Time Magazine. This is an article that actually is titled Preach Like Your Faith Depends Upon It. And in this article, it sets forth, it sets forth, and I'm talking about Christianity in the big umbrella, it sets forth the fact that Americans at a steadily growing rate more and more are having no religious affiliation. You know why? I submit to you it's because religion does not offer them anything. It does not offer them a set of rules or a set of guidelines that give them some structure. Now, friends, I know that you will realize that most people want structure in their life. There's some, there's some people out there that don't know what they want, and they say they want anarchy. You know, they don't want any rules. But, friends, if there is no rules, there's still going to be a rule. Think about that. In anarchy, when, 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 there are no, when there is no government, there's still rules. And the rules are made by the ones who have the strongest. So you cannot live in a world that is totally free from a system that puts forth a standard of what is acceptable and not acceptable by someone. Because in a, rule, in a system, in a world or society where there are no rules, somebody is going to make the rules. Somebody's going to tell you what you can and cannot do. Someone is going to tell you where you can and cannot go. Someone is going to tell you what you can and cannot eat. Someone is going to tell you what you can and cannot drive. Someone is going to tell you where you can and cannot live. Someone is going to set some rules. Now, if you're one of these people that say, well, we can't call anything bad or anything good, you know what? You're only contributing to the problem. You're only contributing to the problem. And more and more, the church, I'm using that term very, very loosely, but the, the church or Christianity in general, what they're doing is they're saying, you know what, we're going to fall into that trap. We're, go we're not going to condemn anybody. And look at this. You have more and more people who are leaving religion and having no religious affiliation. You know why? I submit because it doesn't give them a set of structures that they're looking for, and everybody's looking for. Everybody wants a, a system that's fair, but religion doesn't offer them that. Or what they find in the churches, they can find out in the world. You know, we did a program not too long ago on the bar church. Now, why would anybody, why would anybody want to go to a church where there's a bar when they can go to the same bar on Saturday night that is no different than where they're going on Sunday morning. And the only difference is on Sunday morning someone's going to be there talking about Jesus. But you know what? How are you going to tell that person that they're wrong? Are you going to tell that person that, you know what, you need to quit being a drunk? If you can't tell anybody they're right or wrong, how are you going to do that? So people are leaving religion because it doesn't offer them anything to be desired. There's no change. There's no, there's no uh, 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 discipline in their life, really. And so the problem, then, the problem then becomes how are we going to change that? You know what the so-called experts are saying? How they're going to turn the tide on people who are living religion, uh, leaving religion? You know what they're going to do? They're going to start doubling down with what they teach. A double down. Instead of making it more marketable, instead of saying, you know what, this is, we're going to do the things that everybody likes, and we're going to offer hamburgers and hot dogs and, and cookies and cakes, and we're going to have big bands and everything, you know what they're going to start doing? They're going to start doubling down. Now, these mega churches, these big churches that bring in the bands and, and everything, there's a, a church up here in, in Eden, uh, Charity Baptist Church. I was I was looking on their Facebook page. You know they got bands coming in. They got the the Easter's are coming in, and and you, you know what, friends? When it gets right down to it, let's think about it. There is a community church. There is a quote unquote non denominational religious group that can do that better than you can. Trust me. There there's some group that has bigger band, a louder band has more smoke, has more mirrors, has more and better food than you do. 
So if that's what you're going to give people in order to get them in, somebody else can outdo you. They just can. See, I don't know if, I don't know if, if like Charity Baptist, they're in Eden. I don't know if they're trying to compete with Osborne Baptist, but let me tell you, Osborne Baptist can outdo you. I, you know, I've been on, in one of their services, man. They got, the, they got the rock music blaring and the smoke machines going, and boy, let me tell you, they put on a concert. So if that's what you're doing to get people in, somebody else cannot do you. So what the religions are saying, you know what, we need to double down. And by double down, what they mean is they mean have a renewed commitment to the Great Commission. And now listen to what one of the big-time Baptists says. This is Albert Moeller, president of the Southern Baptist Convention Flagship Seminary. He says this, the evangelical movement in America in the 21st century is going to be forced back into the book of Acts. Now, friends, if you think for one moment, if you think for one moment that you are going to win souls and influence people by not telling them you need to change, you don't need to go over to the book of Acts. If you think that going back to the book of Acts is going to be a soft gospel, you haven't read the book of Acts lately. If you think that you cannot win souls and influence people by telling them they're lost or telling them, convincing them that they, that they need to change, you haven't read the book of Acts. Because what this modern idea of, of telling people, well, let's don't tell them that they're lost, that is so far from the Bible. If you're going to get back to the Bible, you need to do what we've been doing all along. Friends, what we have been saying all along is get back to the book of Acts. But you know what? We had actually had a, a, a Baptist preacher up in Martinsville. Let me think. Uh, Hughes. Randy Hughes. Randall Hughes. Uh, up, in, uh, up in Martinsville. He's still preaching up in Martinsville. He actually wrote a letter and said the book of Acts is a transitional book. It's a transitional book, so... You know, it's not really something you get to. It's not really something you use for your doctrine. Well, friends, you know what? When you stop using the foundational book of the Bible as the foundation for the doctrine of the New Testament church, guess what you're going to get? You're going to start getting a watered-down gospel that's going to cause people to say, see ya. Because you start teaching people that they don't have to do anything to be saved. You're going to start teaching people that, you know what? I'm, going to I'm not going to tell you you're lost because then you'll leave. I'm not going to start preaching on marriage and divorce and telling people that you can't be in a marriage with somebody because then they're going to leave and they'll get mad. You start focusing on numbers. How do you think Billy Graham got to where he is? It's by watering down what his version of the gospel. He wasn't even preaching the true gospel. He was, water he was watered down gospel, and he watered down even more. My point, friends, is this. The Bible, it does not know this idea of let's don't tell people they're lost or let's don't tell people they're bad. As a matter of fact, I remember our Lord and Savior saying something along this line. Notice this. In Matthew chapter 21, in verse 33, listen to what Jesus says. Matthew 21, verse 33. Hear another parable. There was a certain household, uh, householder which planted a, a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it. Boy, we preach up a storm now. And did the wine press in it and, and built a, a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a foreign, uh, foreign country. And the husbandman took his servants. Sorry about that. And when the uh, time of fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandman that they might receive fruits of it. Verse 25, And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. And again he sent other. And again he sent... Oops, sorry about that. And again he sent other uh, servants, more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. 
But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. Verse 26, And they caught him, and they cast him out of the vineyard, and uh, slew him. And when the Lord therefore the vineyard uh, cometh, what will he do unto these husbands? They said unto him, He will miserably destroy these wicked, listen, these wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbands, which shall render him the fruit. Verse 42, Then Jesus said unto them, did you n never read in the scripture the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given unto a nation that bringeth forth the fruits thereof. Now watch this, verse 44. And whosoever shall fall on, uh, fall on this, his stone shall be broken, and whosoever it shall fall will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. Jesus told a parable and used wicked men and these folks said, you know what, he's talking about us. Now, someone says, well, Jesus didn't actually come out and say they were wicked. Well, not on this occasion he didn't. On this occasion he gave a parable and they gathered it. They put two and two together and they came up with the answer. He's calling us wicked. But friends, do you realize that if we go back to the book of Acts and we go back to the, to the first century church and we go back to the, to the uh, uh, beginning of the gospel when it was spread, do you realize that those people were being told that they were wicked? Do you realize that those people were being told they need to change? Do you realize those people were being told that they were evil? Do you realize that those people were being told you have sinned? That's exactly what you find. Let's look at this. Go ahead and put the phone lines up, Matt, if you would. And, uh, but let's look at this. Let's just start in Acts chapter 2. The first gospel sermon, friends. Look at this. The first gospel sermon. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, Peter and the other 11 are standing up and they're preaching. And notice right out of the gate, this is, this is early on in the sermon. Notice what Peter says. He says him, talking about Jesus, him being delivered by the, by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye, he's talking to his audience, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Sounds to me like Peter was being pretty pointed and pretty blunt in telling people, you are guilty. Now, Peter didn't know that He's not going to win souls. He's not going to save people by telling them they're wicked. He doesn't know that if he preaches like this, people are going to leave. He doesn't know that by saying harsh things like this and being so plain and bold, he doesn't know that people aren't going to listen to him. He doesn't know that this is not a way to fill up a church building. He doesn't know that, you know, this is mean and cruel. What he does know is they are guilty of sin and they need to know beyond a shadow of doubt where they stand. He doesn't know anything about this. Well, you shouldn't tell people they're bad or they're going to be bad. Friends, they were already bad. They killed the Lord and Savior. And by Peter holding that back and not pointing that out, it's not helping them at all. As a matter of fact, all it's doing is making it worse for the audience. So Peter is actually doing them a favor by pointing out the problem. Now, that's Acts chapter 2. That's Acts chapter 2. Now, let's come down to the end of the sermon. Look at this. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Here's, here's a, a, a major point, a, 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 a major, it's not really the conclusion of a sermon, but here is a major thrust in Peter's sermon. He says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter actually came out and said, you killed him. He said it twice. You killed him. Peter, you're not going to get any kind of conversions like that. You're not going to get anybody to respond. You keep preaching like that. You're going to drive people away. Well, 
if you read the text, and you, you probably know this, but in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 and verse 36, when Peter made that statement, after he's already told, after they've already been told, the audience, after the audience has already been told twice, you are a murderer. You have crucified the Lord. You are guilty. I'm talking to you. I didn't say we. I said you. You're guilty. What happened? What happened when he said that? Verse 37 says, Now, when they heard this, they were preaching their heart. And said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, I thought harsh preaching and telling people they're lost. I didn't think that that worked. I didn't think I didn't think people responded to that kind of preaching. I didn't think people responded to people telling them that they're that they're lost. Well, they did in the book of Acts. If we're gonna go back to the book of Acts and have a renewed uh, desire for the Great Commission, and again I'm talking to members of the church, you need to realize that pointed and plain preaching is what is essential. And that means telling people that yes, you're wrong. You're wrong. You know, we get a lot of grief sometimes because, and from, from our brethren again, they say, well, you shouldn't tell people that they're lost. You shouldn't tell people that they're going to hell. Well, what am I supposed to tell them? When people call in and say, look, you're saying that you have to be in the church of Christ in order to be saved. And if I'm in a denomination, if I'm in a Baptist church, Methodist church, whatever, that I'm lost. Are, are you telling me that if I stay in these denominations that I'm lost? What am I supposed to tell them, friends? What am I supposed to tell them? Am I supposed to say, well, you know, I can't really say anything because I don't want to hurt your feelings. Am I supposed to just water it down and not tell you the truth? Am I supposed to just tone it down and... and and instead of hurting your feelings, running the risk of hurting your feelings, am I supposed to tell you, yeah, friend, you're okay. Just go ahead and do whatever you want to do. Well, you know what? If I do that, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be just as lost as you are. I'd be in hell with you. If I didn't tell you what you needed to do to be saved and what you needed to do to change, if I didn't tell you you were wrong, I'd be just as lost. But if I tell you the truth... If I tell you the truth, I give you the option. I give you the choice. See? I don't want to take the choice away from you. I'm going to tell you the truth. And I, and I trust that a good and honest heart is going to do exactly what God says. In the book of Acts, they didn't know that you weren't supposed to tell people that they're lost. They didn't know you weren't supposed to tell people that, well, they're bad. Look at this. In Acts 3, now we're, we're in the next chapter. Acts 3 and verse 13. Listen to what Peter says. Now, Peter's preaching again. It's, it's another day. Now, he's preaching. And notice this. The God of our fathers hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. So Pilate was going to let Jesus go, and you delivered him up. You delivered him up. Uh, verse 14. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the prince of life. Peter, don't you learn that if you tell people that they're lost, that they're murderers, you're actually, you actually telling these people that they killed Jesus. You're saying that they were guilty. Peter, that's not going to work. Well, it worked the first time. You know what? It works the second time too. So again, in the book of Acts, there was a lot of plain pointed and Profound preaching being done by Peter. Telling people, yes, you're lost. Yes, you're wrong. Yes, you're wrong. Friends, if you're wrong, you're wrong. Now, you want to see another one? Look at this in Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, guess what you find? Now you find Peter again. Peter's preaching again, and look what he says. In Acts 4 and verse 10, he says to these group of religious leaders, he says, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God has raised from the dead, even by him did this man stand here before you hold. Peter, you keep telling people they crucified Jesus. You keep harping on this idea that they crucified Jesus. 
You're going to make some people mad. You keep harping on that. You keep hammering that point home. Every time you preach, you just talk about, you talk about how everybody's wrong. You talk about how everybody's crucified Jesus. Peter, don't you know you're not supposed to do that? You can't tell people they're wrong. Well, Peter just hammered away at it. No, you crucified Jesus. You crucified Jesus. You crucified Jesus. You killed the Son of God. You're wrong. You killed him. You're a murderer. You're guilty. Blood's on your hand. Friends, I know that's pretty bold. It's pretty harsh. But you know what? It's really in the best interest of the audience. Have you ever stopped to think where those people would be if Peter hadn't been so plain and forthright? Have you ever realized that those people that were hearing this wouldn't have had a chance to obey the Lord and Savior? Who wouldn't have a chance to have their sins forgiven if they hadn't been told in no uncertain terms, you're lost, you're a murderer, you're guilty? See, friends, we're not the kind of people that are going to sugarcoat the truth in order to make, your, make you feel better. Because what we know is, if you obey from the heart, that form of doctrine that was delivered to you, Romans 6, 17, 16 and 17, we know that if you do what God says, you will feel better for having obeyed God. See, you'll feel a whole lot better for having obeyed God than anything I could say if I whitewashed the truth. Do you think in the first century they didn't tell people in no uncertain terms that they're lost? They certainly did. Look what we've seen. In Acts chapter 2, people were told, you killed Christ. In Acts chapter 3, they were told, you killed Christ. In Acts chapter 4, they were told, you killed Christ. I'm seeing a theme here. I'm seeing a pattern here. Every time the gospel was preached... The gospel preacher was always telling them in no uncertain terms, here's your problem. Here's where, here's where you're wrong. Here's where you need to change. Now, in case you think that those three times were a fluke, let's just look at chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, friends, guess what we find? In Acts chapter 5, I want to back up and get just a little bit of context on this. In Acts chapter 5, you have a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife. They sold a possession. Now, here's what was happening. They had some folks in the, in the first century who were selling land, and they were giving the proceeds to be used for the work of the church. All right? And here you have a man named Joseph, who's uh, by the apostle surnamed Barnabas. We know who Barnabas is. He was a Levite, the son of a Levite, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having a land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it to the apostles' feet. Now, in chapter 5, you have a man named Ananias and Sapphira. Now, what they're trying to do is they're trying to keep up with the Josephs. Not keep up with the Joneses. They're keeping up with the Josephs. Because guess what they do? They sell a land. They sell a land, a possession, and they keep back part of the price. In other words, they say, well, we sold some land, and here's all the money we got from it. But that's really not all the money they got from it. They kept back part of it, and they want it to be, look, they want it to be seen as someone who gave it all. Now, look what Peter said. Well, here's Peter again. You know, Peter, this bold, forthright preacher who's pointed and plain and doesn't pull any punches, look what he tells them. Peter said to Ananias, Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Peter, you just called that man a liar. You just said he lied, Peter. That's right. He lied. And to keep back part of the price of the land, he says, whilst it remained, whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Now, friends, let that sink in a little bit. Peter actually told, now watch this. He actually told a member of the church. He actually told one of his brethren, Brother, you're lying. 
Brother, you're lying. Now, that's what Peter said to Ananias. And then he said the same thing to, to, to Sapphira later on. All right? He said, look, you're, you're lying. Now, was it doing them a favor? Yes, it was doing them a favor. It certainly was doing them a favor. Friends, my point is in the first century, truth was always spoken. It wasn't, wasn't sure goaded. It said, look, you're wrong. Now, let's come back to the very first thing we listened to tonight. That man calling in and saying, if you would quit telling people they're bad, they'd quit being bad. Friends, do you think the Ananias and Sapphira would have quit being bad if Peter hadn't have told them you lied? You know what? If Peter hadn't have told them you lied to the Holy Ghost, you lied to God, you know what they'd have done? They'd have sold some more land, more than likely, and they'd have made a bigger lie. Because that's usually what happens. When you don't correct a problem, it usually gets bigger. And so even dealing with brethren, sometimes you've got to just come out and say, look, look, you're lying. We know you're lying. You've been caught in a lie. Now, I'm just saying, friends, that's, that's pointed preaching. And that, but that's not the kind of preaching that you'd find today, but it's what you'll find in the church of Christ. It's what you'll find in the church of Christ. Look at this. You don't think that's the case? Look in Acts chapter 6. And chapter 7. Acts chapter 6 and chapter 7. In chapter 6, you find a man named, you meet a man named Stephen. And Stephen starts preaching and he starts expounding the truth to a group of people, one of which was, a, was a, uh, from uh, the, uh, for, from, from Sicilia. All right? We know a guy named, a guy from there, his name's Saul of Tarsus. And we'll meet Saul at the end of chapter 7. But Stephen is preaching, and the Bible says that these folks in this synagogue, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. And so they actually had to lie about Stephen. And they said he blasphemed, and he spoke against Moses and against God. We've heard him. And they stirred up the people, and the elders, and the scribes, and they camped on him, and they caught him, and they set him before the council, and they brought out the false witnesses, and, and eventually they're going to kill him. But look at this. In chapter 7, in chapter 7, Stephen starts giving his defense. And he starts talking to them about their fathers. He says, your forefathers, you know, our, he says our fathers. Our fathers, they, were, they, you know, they came from Abraham. And our fathers, they took, they took Joseph and sold him into slavery. And God delivered him anyway. And then God raised up Moses. And our fathers, they took Moses you know, rejected him, and God delivered him anyway by Moses' hand. And then notice what happens when he gets down to chapter, uh, or chapter 7 and about verse uh, uh, 48 or so. When he gets down to talking about Jesus, notice what he says. He says, your fathers, he says, your fathers uh, have, have done this. I'm going to try to get here to it. He says, how be it the Most High dwells not in temple us? Come on down about verse 49, 50. He says, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised, 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised the heart and the ears. What? Stephen, you're not going to get anybody win any points like that. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised the heart and the ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so did ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Do you see a common thread here? Every time they're preaching, you killed him. You're a liar. You're stiff-necked. You're uncircumcised the heart and ears. You're rebellious. You need to repent. Now the difference is in Acts chapter 7, these people have been arguing with the truth all along. They'd already lied about the, the preacher. He definitely wasn't pulling any punches. And let me just say this. That's why, friends, sometimes we get accused of being mean. But you know what? Most of the time when, when uh, these preachers get on our radar, 
You know why? It's because they've been lying about us to start with. It gets back to us. One of their members comes out and says, well, here's what my preacher says. Or come talk to my preacher. And we talk to them and he starts lying. Well, the next thing you know, now they're on our radar. Friends, if I talk to someone and they're honest and they're looking for the truth, I'm going to be as long-suffering with them as long as we're moving together and we're studying together and we're trying to come to the truth together. But in Acts chapter 7, these folks started lying. But the result was always the same. When people stop hearing the truth or when it gets to the point that they need to hear the truth, the unvarnished truth, we're going to tell it to them. And the honest ones will receive the truth. The honest ones love the truth enough to accept it. Friends, what are we supposed to say? Are we supposed to not say anything? Or are we supposed to tell people that they're wrong? Yes. Is it wrong if we tell them they're wrong? Or would it be wrong to not tell them that they're wrong? Friends, I say this. I'd rather be right with God and wrong with man any day. And so... I'm not going to stop telling people the truth. I'm not going to stop telling people what they need to hear. I want to tell them the truth. I want to tell them the plain truth. Even if it means running the risk of hurting their feelings a little bit, if I hurt their feelings a little bit now and save their soul, I'll be all happy about it, and they'll, they'll, they'll be glad about it in the end as well. Friends, we love you, and that's why we tell you the truth. If you need to obey the gospel... We want to help you. If you want to study the Bible more, we'll be glad to assist you in any way we can. Here's our content information. We're going off the air. Till next week, thank you for watching. Always remember to ask, what does the Bible say? And you'll get a word from the Lord. Have a good night. We certainly do appreciate that. We do want to let you know we're making our way down uh, just uh, as a matter of fact, one more day left in this week before the big official kickoff of summer, the Memorial Day holiday weekend. And we've got uh, news for you, including tomorrow. Tomorrow on the broadcast, we'll tell you more about highway patrol efforts to try to stop speeders, stop people from driving drunk, and of course, pay attention to the road. All of that coming up on our Friday newscast. So, yes, we will be.